<laughs> what? Your face just open and I'm recording. Oh, you're, oh, well, welcome back to Jamie's Crazy Life. This is like part two, I guess, of St. Augustine. We're going to do the ghost, tra ghost, ghost train adventure. Ghost train adventure. It's an Ripley's, hour, ghost Ripley's ghost train adventure. It's an hour and a half long <laughs> because our day got changed. As you'll see in the first half of this video. I mean, first half. The first video from this trip. Which is, I don't know what it's going to be called. But we are now sitting outside of Ripley's waiting for the 8 o'clock train, which happens in about an hour. Debating on whether or not we want to eat a peanut butter sandwich real quick. Which I think we probably should eat a quick peanut butter sandwich. I think we should. I want to go someplace else. No, because by the time we walk across the street, I'm talking to you, but I'm talking to them. By the time me and Katie walk across the street, go find a restaurant, sit down and try to get something to eat, um, it'll be time to come right back here for this train. So we have granola, we, we have trail mix in our bag if we get hungry while we're out and about. And we have water bottles and we got a gallon of water back here. We need to fill that. We even have Mountain Dew if we want some Mountain Dew. Um, so I think I'm going to quickly make a peanut butter sandwich and eat at least a half a peanut butter sandwich before we go. So there's something in my stomach because I haven't eaten a lot today. So she's going to pause this until we get started <laughs> on the train. So say, say goodbye for the moment. Pause this so I can go find a fork or a spoon or something in this truck. All right, you guys, we're in the bathroom. So on the back of the door, it says, believe it or not, 40,000 Americans are injured each year by a toilet. This other one says, a rest in peace in the bathroom wall caused when a towel rack was pulled off, off formed the perfect outline of the man's head. Believe it or not, submitted by Beverly Farron, Baltimore, MD. Then this one says, accidental plumbing. Bathrooms discovered in the Royal Palace in Mary and Syria, S-Y-R-I-A, Syria, uncovered after having been buried for 4,000 years, had modern inside plumbing that still worked. So... Oh, here's another one. Martha Hillborough of Nor uh, Linden, Norway, received her very first indoor bathroom as a 100th birthday present, believe it or not. So she got a brow toilet. Then over here, conversations at Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia used 700 rolls of toilet paper to soak salt in to destroy the brick building. Believe it or not. What's that one over there? Slim. Slim Jean Duck. There's some in the toilet. Slim Jean Duck. Don't sound Okay. Slim Jean Duck owns a house shaped like a toilet in someplace South Korea, believe it or not. Car stealing wheels carried more than twice as many germs as a toilet seat, believe it or not. Ooh, you guys. <laughs> Our steering wheels have more germs on them. And then there's like these things on the toilets. They're clean bathrooms, see? All right, we'll grab your water. Okay, no. I'm gonna put this on pause. We, make it back up all here. we are on Never the mind. ghost tour train. So, uh, now, uh, as I do, and you put the meter in front of you, you can probably have a conversation with it. And uh, there's a couple of ways of doing this. Uh, you can say, uh, well, you know, are you a man? Are you a woman? And if the meter goes off, that's considered to be a yes. This uh, sometimes works. Uh, with a group this small and with this kind of composition, we might have better luck than we do other nights. There are many nights when we have a large group, but there's just somebody who's there who's just, let's just say the spirits are not necessarily uh, feeling that person's energy. Let's put it that way. 
Uh, so we might have better luck than we often do. Now, what we do have uh, really good luck with often on these tours is taking photos. Now, when we take photos, we're going to take them in a more scientific way. We're not going to take a whole bunch of random photos and be, oh, hey, that was something weird. That, that must be a ghost. No, we're going to take them, uh, well, here's where we're going. We're looking for two different things. We're looking for light figures. We're looking for shadow figures. Now, light figures, the things you normally think of when you think of a ghostly figure or an apparition. Uh, things might be here in a window, a doorway, whatever it may be. But also rods of light and orbs, but orbs is where we got to pop the brakes here for a second, because orbs can be caused by all sorts of things. Uh, so this is why when you take your photos, take three or four photos, all of the same thing from the same spot. Now, when you do this, when you do this, uh, take, if you uh, get an orb, uh, take a look at that photo. If that orb appears in all those photos, then that was probably a normal orb. A bit of dust on your lens, a reflection of a light you didn't notice, something like that. But if that orb only appears in one or two of your photos, that's more and more likely to be something that was unusual, something that was appearing in our world for just a moment before it lost energy and went back where it came from. You get an orb like that, zoom in, take a closer look. We get interesting things with those words. Faces, figures, skulls. You get anything like that, definitely share those photos with us. Now, that's what we're looking for when it comes to light figures. When it comes to shadow figures, this is why we have our laser grid. Now, typically, uh, we like to leave the laser grid pinned down for a long period of time to look for disturbances, but we do often have interesting things happen if we use it along with our camera. Now, it's not like this is kind of ghost flashlight. So, you're gonna be taking those three or four photos again. So perhaps you might think that, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe uh, the mission over there is haunted or something, whatever it may be. Lay down your uh, laser grid pin in a kind of regular pattern. You take those three or four photos again. Then, when you take, look at those photos, you're looking for a place where there's a shadow caused by something that is unexplained in that laser that pattern, or a blur in part of it, not all of it, but just a part of it. So it gives you another thing to look for. Again, it's not really a flashlight, you're just using it along with your camera. Now, these are the various kinds of things we're hoping to find tonight, the tools we have. Would you folks like to know about our first investigation stop? It's the uh, north end of the George Fairbanks plantation. It's the site of a human tragedy, mass grave. Uh, you know what, actually, I, I, I'm sorry to be a part. You know what, I, I, I'm, I'm actually going to shift over here, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the fact that St. Oxley, we've got spirits that are all over this town. A lot of these, uh, a lot of these places, bed and breakfast, they've got spirits, just ask, you know, they, they have places that haunt them all the time. But then we do other things that kind of stir up the spirits. You see, uh, we do all these things where we build historic recreations. We, we build old buildings that look like they used to look like when the spirits were alive. We dress up people in clothing like that, and then that uh, looks not quite right. Well, the place where we do that, a couple blocks down that way, is over at the Fountain of Youth. And, uh, well, okay, so let me kind of lay out the scene there of uh, what kind of spirits, what kind of things they, we're going to be running, what they might run into over there. So, one thing that happens over there, you see, first of all, over there they did an archaeological dig. They discovered that that is a place where the Native Americans and the Spanish were living side by side in those very early days of St. Augustine. And one thing the Spanish were very interested in was converting the Native Americans to the Spanish ways and the spirits that reflect that. Now, there's a woman down there by the name of Amy who works in the Native Village that they've got all recreated down there. And she says that, you know, when it gets a bit after five o'clock or so and it's starting to get a little dark, she'll sometimes, uh, well, she'll sometimes see two, you know, young boys about the age of 10 or so uh, that are standing in the shade of the huts. And they're dressed in Spanish clothing, but they are definitely Native American. You can see them kind of nudging each other, looking at people, maybe making a joke of the folks as they go by. And, and okay, that's, that's what they do in a place where they're comfortable. But down from the down the road from there, down the road from there, that's where the blacksmith shop is. And uh, well, think about what comes out of the blacksmith shop. The Spanish brought it there. They brought a smoke, fire, noise, and things they create there are weapons, chains. Nothing the natives are really going to like. And so, well, Craig, who won't work at the blacksmith shop anymore, he warned me. When you're working there, be very careful because you see, sometimes you'll find a situation where a hammer's on this side and it's over on that, and that's fine. Your tongs are suddenly in the fire. That can be a bit of a problem. But he was telling me about one day when he asked to make some chain, just go across the doorway. As heating up the fire to make this chain, the fire kept getting hotter and hotter and hotter. So hot it kept burning the metal. And, and he couldn't understand why it was happening. And then he heard this kind of whispering and, and then looked over the corner and saw a kind of shadowy figures kind of waving in the corner. And then he looked over and there on the bellows were the handprints of two small children as though he'd been pushing down those bellows to make the fire so hot he could not make that chain. Now, that is what they do in a place where nothing particularly dark has happened. But I've been noticing people holding up their meters here and there because uh, probably since, uh, I don't know, last two, three blocks here, a couple blocks since we passed that last intersection, 
We've been at another hot spot right here. Yeah, how many people's meters have been going? A few of you? Yeah, several of you. Yeah. This whole area right here, uh, the, on both sides, uh, there were a number of slave shanties in this area. This is the George Fairbanks plantation. We passed over the south end when we cut through that light. It was 16 square blocks total, orange trees as far as the eye could see, with, well, you know, as I say, a few shanties here and there. Now, George Fairbanks, he considered himself to be a very, off. you know, fine southern gentleman, but uh, my, my meter is not showing off. So he thought he'd give this a try. And so, well, to do this, he brought himself the orange trees who grow the fastest, the very fastest they could. This is about the 1833 this happens. 1835, 1835, the worst free St. Augustine had seen in nearly a century came along. Now, it wasn't just bad enough that, uh, well, it killed off George Fairbanks' oranges. It killed off all the orange trees. His Fairbanks plantation was dead and gone. He abandoned the plantation. He abandoned the people here. The worst winter St. Augustine has seen in a very, very long time. Now, they barely had any shelter. As I say, they were sh slave shanties that were designed for Florida. So, yeah. Now, they went to the town. They asked for help. They're told there's no help to be given. There's no shelter. There's no food. This is George Fairbanks' problem. But he's gone to Amelia Island. So they did the very best they could. Between the age of them, some are too old, too sick, too young. Twenty of them did not survive. Well, Venus, the spiritual leader of the plantation, she told them they would make it, but... That ended up being a lie. So she filled the best she could. She gathered them from their very slave shanties, brought them right here, and buried them in one mass grave uh, back to the north end of George Fairbanks plantation. Now, they did, they did the very best they could, and it ended up having to be them who pulled out the family Bibles and said the, said the prayers, because they couldn't even get the priest to come out and give them their final rites. And that means this ends up being one mass unhallowed grave. That left the darkness on this land that continues to this day. In the 1980s and the 1990s, without knowing what had happened here, the old Florida Museum came through here and they built a number of historic recreations. And now we have that historic recreation problem again. But now it's not a place where, you know, the natives and the Spanish were living side by side. We have a place where there was a genuine human tragedy. And so things get really dark here. Now, it was May 9th, 1994, when a fourth grade school group got so terrified that they trampled over each other in the process of trying to escape. Word got out this place was too haunted to even have a business here. And that's when Ripley said, you know what? That's the kind of bad reputation we're looking for. So we have no folks like you who want to do serious ghost investigations. Now, in just a moment here, we'll be headed out back to the, uh, yep, we'll be headed out back. And I'll take you uh, directly to the north end of the George Fairbanks plantation. We can get our investigation started right away. I'll take you over to the native hut first, and then uh, we'll take a look and see what else we can find here. Okay. They are taking us into the plantation. It was not creepy. Yeah, it was. No, it wasn't. This is some sort of hood. Come on over, folks. Come on over. This is a hut. Looks like it's covered with pond fronds. All right. Now, <clears throat> when I'm uh, done telling you all about this, you're welcome to go inside a couple of these buildings. You're welcome to go inside this one here, as well as the building with the stairs on it over there. Maybe that here in just a minute. Now, this building right here, this is the Native American Hut, May 9th, 1994, about 2.30 in the afternoon. It was just an average fourth grade school group in here, seated on the benches, right inside there. And it suddenly became very cold and very dark, like a storm cell came overhead. And the fourth graders may be letting off, uh, I don't know, they were scared, but they kind of looked at each other kind of very nervously. And the fourth grade teacher, I don't know, maybe playing a joke on them, lets off a little scream, let's go eat. But this was enough to really, truly set off the children. They began screaming. They began screaming in true terror. And as that children's terror rose in this building, it became so dark in here, they were unable to make their way out. Now, you can see this doorway. It is wide enough to could fit maybe three fourth graders shoulder to shoulder. But for a full minute, they were unable to make their way out. Now, it was so dark, 
they, they couldn't see anywhere in here. They tried breaking through several places, actually over there on the far side when you go inside, you can see it in there, uh, where they tried to break through. Now, after nearly a full minute, the figure appeared inside the chair there. That is the chief's throne. And from there, that light figure emanated light and it dispelled the darkness. The children were actually able to see and make their way out. They trampled over each other. Well, and that was the end of the old court you can see in here. But if you do go in there, you will, as I say, notice a few holes on the wall. You also notice that there's a fair bit of uh, sort of uh, residual haunting. People's videos go off quite a bit in that particular building. Now, these next two buildings here, these two are a recreation of Again, none of the old plantations existed anymore. They were, they barely existed for, what, two, three years after all the people died here. They were not designed as well. These are the new areas that were controlled by the old board. Now, people investigate this, they often get a very dark and oppressive scene. Uh, there's a bit of a mist that they often sent to this area that we get in photos. Uh, people have described as ectoplasm. That's personally a bit of a stretch for me, but it's definitely something interesting that people are capturing in this area. Now, it's down over here where we find the most interesting or streaks and sometimes, at least for me, the things in the photos that have been the most distinct. It is in this area right here, in front of the stable area, where I believe the mass grave is. In the old Florida Museum they had to dig all sorts of conduit and stuff, and in that process they found enough bone fragments to not the University of Florida and confirmed that they were human. Uh, but you might have noticed we're on the train for a minute. We are too far north from the old city for anyone who really gives a proper grant for an archaeological dig, perhaps someday. But it's in this area where we have gotten many orbs, and I've seen some very good photos people have taken of a figure walking back and forth. We believe this is Venus, that spiritual leader of the slaves here. She was one, well, every time we have a psychic come through, she always will say to that psychic, sorry, as almost sort of a preface. We don't think she's saying sorry to the psychic. We think she's saying sorry to all those people who are buried here. Now, the one last one that I'm going to point out is down here at the very end, we have an old abandoned schoolroom. Really not much coming from there. Sometimes we can pull it. Now, I'm going to send Jeremy away in just a moment here. If you have any questions about any of this other stuff, I'll be glad to answer. But I do have one final thought. Now, do not just rely on the technology. Remember, people investigating spirits for a very, very long time. They have a, a many have an innate sense for it, even if you're not truly a believer. Uh, maybe it's the hair on the back of the neck that sticks up, uh, a sense of dread, a sense of cold, whatever it is for you. In places like this where so many dark things have happened, listen to that sense. It'll help you find the spirits just as much as it can. The ghosts are out there. Oh, and uh, the classroom here, I'm sorry. This is our ghost gallery. You want to look inside there if you like. We won't that thing out here. I'll take us all inside and tell us the questions from there. But I encourage you to have as much as you like. This is the old schoolhouse. That's a stables area. There's an orb. There's an orb right there. See it? Yeah, it goes away. It's back. I'm walking back towards some of the other buildings. Now this is the the uh, the Native American hut. It's supposed to be a chief's chair right there. All right. 
So this right here is one of our earliest paranormal investigators, a woman by the name of Ida Alice Flatler. Now, I call her a paranormal investigator, but that's not what she came down here for. She came down here for a honeymoon to one of the richest people in America, Henry Flagler. He owned himself all the railroads going up and down the east coast of Florida, had himself many beautiful hotels. The very first of those beautiful hotels was right down here in downtown St. Augustine, the Ponce de Leon Hotel. And in the penthouse suite, the beautiful, very sweet at the top, that's where she's going to be having her honeymoon with a fine Henry Flagler. And this, she figures, is her in the high society. She gets to have a, you know, lift of pinky tea with all those high society ladies. But it turns out, no, all those high society ladies, they're going to turn their nose at her. See, they all know how Henry Flagler met Ida Alice. Uh, Ida Alice met Henry Flagler by being the nurse for Henry Flagler's first wife. Now, I'm not going to say anything appropriate happened while the first wife lay sick and dying, because I don't have to. All those ladies back then had all sorts of things to say. Uh, the people, they would not talk to her, but they would talk about her. The people who would talk to her, they were attacking the same reasons why we are on the screen tonight. They called themselves spiritualists. They're trying to make contact with the other side. Now tonight we've got all of these fancy tools, these laser grid pens, the EMF meters. Now we're not using these because they are better. Quite honestly, they're more prone to false positives. We're using them because they are safer. You all can see what's in front of her right there, the Ouija board. Okay. Now in those days, they're only about 10, 15 years old. They didn't really understand in those early days that all problems could happen with them. Ida Alice got invited to a seance. And at the end of the seance, the medium turned to her, says, Ida, I can sense your spirit. You have a gift for this. I have this gift for you. And gave her the Ouija board, telling her the wood came all the way from Europe. She began using the Ouija board, first with her friends, but then for hours and hours in, alone in that third floor room. Now, I don't know if you've ever read the rules for using the Ouija board, but the first one is never use it alone. Now, we'll up there, she came in the midst of a very strange idea. Her true love in life, not Henry Flagler, no, not the man she'd been married to, rather this man right over here, Tsar Nicholas II, a man who ruled Russia in those days, a man who she had never met. But she was convinced that he was on the other side of the world using his Ouija board to talk to her through her Ouija board as though some sort of psychic telegraph. Okay, you see the problem here, that Tsar Nicholas was very much alive. He did not use the Ouija board that way. He was only used to talk to the dead. She was in contact with something on the other side, something very dark, something that had a vendetta against the refined man. Tell her, oh, the only thing keeping you from being the Tsar of Russia, from being my love, is your husband. Deal with him. So one night in the penthouse suite, she took her sewing chairs and she tried to stab Henry Flagler. Now, fortunately, he uh, was his wife and acting strange, so able to fend her off without too much harm to himself. But as you might imagine, this was the end of their marriage. She was committed to an asylum for the remainder of her days. Now, of course, there's many people in this town who tell you that, you know, there's no such thing as ghosts. And so if Ida Alice tried to stab her husband, well, it's not because the spirits told her to. It's because she was mad. She probably deserved to be locked up. But whether you believe that or not, by the day she died in that asylum, she had been climbing the walls for years. The last place she had any sanity, any mind of her own, beautiful Palm San Hotel. And that's where her spirit returned. Except for one little problem. Uh, anybody here uh, know what we use the old uh, Palm San Hotel for now? It's Flagler College. The rooms once cost thousands of dollars a night for the richest people in America are now the freshman girls' dormitories. Really nice deal for the freshman girls until you consider the fact that when they check in, they don't really realize they're playing sort of an unknown lottery. That last girl to check in, she gets the room that no one wants. The room that Ida Alice always held the seances in. She'll often wake up in the middle of the night, usually during the holiday season, all those parties were going on that Ida Alice never got the invite to. And she'll feel a chill in the room. And as that student looks down the foot of her bed, she'll see that very stern and judging expression on Ida Alice's face looking right back at her. Then she'll fade into darkness. <laughs> now it happens often enough, they almost put in the student handbook, but they say, you know, that's that's bad publicity. So now they just deny it a lot. <laughs> of course, what all those denials really mean? You're on the third floor of Flagler late at night. You're on your own. All right. Now that we're here, we've got ourselves a portrait of Eliza Pitty. Now, Eliza Pitty here, she is one of our many ghosts that happened at the lighthouse. Uh, sometimes you run into lighthouse keepers, but this, this is the daughter of the man who built the lighthouse. His name, Hezekiah Pitty. Halfway through the building of the lighthouse, she died in a horrible drying accident. Now, what's interesting about this portrait is this is what I believe to be the only portrait of Eliza Pitty that shows her as she truly is now. You see, the only picture of Eliza Pitty from when she was alive printed in the newspaper the day after she died, but today's reprints are so bad, there's no telling what she looked like at all. 
So we're going to make this portrait. Our artist turned to a psychic who was regularly visited by Eliza Pitty and made this portrait of Eliza. Not she appeared in life, but she appears to this day as one of St. Augustine's haunting spirits. Hmm. Now, down over here, we have ourselves a portrait of Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth, she appears in front of the city gates. She appears in front of the city gates. In this case, her father was one of our gatekeepers. Now, the gatekeeper was a road gaming position. The month in 1821 that he was gatekeeper was the worst possible. That was the month that yellow fever ripped through this town, killing one out of every three people. One, two, and dead. So many people were dying all at once. They had no choice but to build themselves a new cemetery. A public burying grounds right outside the city gates. The city gatekeeper sees this mass grave, this public burying grounds, filling up day after day after day with victims from the yellow fever. One night he went home and realized his sweet daughter Elizabeth was sick with that same illness. It only took four nights before she died. The night that she died, he swore not letting by to be thrown in this anonymous hole with all these strangers. As a gatekeeper, the only man with the key, he had a plan. He'll sneak a body outside the city gates. It'd be safe until morning. There was nobody else out there, right? Next morning, he gave her a nice burial under a tree, but the next morning, went to go find her body, gone. We don't know if the animal found it or someone took it, but it's from this spot right here that Elizabeth's spirit is still seen. Now, the thing about this is, this closely will ever come to acknowledge or haunt it. People drive by the city gates and uh, you know, they call the police. Uh, there's a young girl all alone. Somebody should check on her. But the police never do. Because one thing they do not do in this town is go ghost hunting in the middle of the night. Now, down here at the end of the hallway, we have ourselves a portrait of Betty Richardson. I will not be telling you about Betty Richardson now, because later on we'll be in the building, in fact, the very room that Betty Richardson died in. Now, you may really guess how she died from the fact that the room is in flames behind her as she enjoys a glass of wine, but uh, I'll simply suggest you get a good look at her now. Perhaps later on tonight you'll see her with your very own eyes. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to step over here for a second. All right. So, right here we have ourselves a portrait of Pedro Menendez. Now, if you may not put a daytime tour, we talk about the great man, Pedro Menendez. The founder of our first city, our first governor, and that's all the nice things we want to say about him. Because that man, see that murderous look in his eye? That man never gave himself another nickname before he ever came here. And that was the Butcher of the Feelings. I'll tell you about that, uh, why he's holding a sword that's so bloody and standing in river blood a little bit later when we're out on the train. But, uh, let me wrap up here with this last one. This is a portrait of one of our many Native American ghosts. We have over 4,000 years of Native American history documented in this area. With that much history, there are many different ghosts, but we do not know the stories that created them. But I can tell you how to spot one. It is a spirit that is very tall, very thin, very ancient, fuzzy from time. It's very likely to be one of our Native Americans, likely to be a member of the Timucua, who may have heard here when Peter Menendez first arrived, and now over 400 years gone. All right, now these are just some of the spirits we find here in St. Augustine. See more, you know what we got to do, right? We got to get on the train, so let's head on out. Saw a shadow. Really? Okay, well, a little bit of a quiet night. All right, well, don't worry. This is just our first stop. We've got others. All right, so now uh, I said I was, uh, well, actually, let's talk a little bit more about our investigation real quick here. Uh, see, first of all, uh, if you do get a ghost photo or anything interesting, we're asking you to please, if you can, share it with us online. Uh, we've got a couple of different social media, or actually a bunch of them. Find any of them Ripley's Ghost Train Adventure, uh, either Facebook, TripAdvisor, and if you have something you want to share with us, go ahead and share with us. Upload it, and uh, in the uh, comments say, For Ghost Library, because, see, that way we can share with other people who will do all sorts of investigations in this town. Now, they might be professional investigators, they might just be taking our tour, they might be taking another tour, they might be investigating uh, books they find at the library, but these are all ways that people investigate this town. So you don't know whether or not you're going to have yourself a ghost story, or whether or not you've got yourself a situation where it's a, uh, just something great that's happening until there's a ghost sighting. So your ghost photo could be the confirmation of a ghost story in this town. A pretty good deal. You'd be part of the story without it being dead. All right. Now, well, let me, uh, I believe I was going to tell you a little bit about good old Pedro Menendez. Now, uh, any of you from visiting from somewhere in Northeast Florida? No? Okay. Okay. All right. So this will be good news. All right. So. Let's begin. <laughs> Pedro Menendez. Uh, so he's known for founding the city, but that was not the first thing that was here. He got sent here not just to start the city, but because there was a French problem. And when I say a French problem, I mean there was a French lord up north here in what was definitely Spanish territory of where Jacksonville is today. And uh, the king of Spain is going to have none of this. 
And so he sends over Pedro Menendez, this guy who's already got himself a nickname as the Butcher of Avili. And he says, go deal with those French using Hades fire is going off again. and blood. Well, that's the kind of thing Pedro Menendez did. So I have a broken one. Over. Now, he first founds the colony of St. Ox, and he's really not more than, a, more than a camp when he takes his soldiers and chops his way through the jungle up to Fort Caroline. Now, the French are not expecting to come through the jungle. They are taken completely by surprise, and Pedro Menendez and his men slaughtered those French soldiers, cut them open from the throat down to the waist, slowly pulled their insides out, and then hung their bodies from the trees. So, so it's no mistake what had happened, he left a note behind, saying, I, Pedro Menendez, the butcher of Avili said Douglas, not because they were French, but because they were not Catholic. And that's how Pedro Hernandez did things in those days. So I guess he celebrated for their up there for several days. I suppose the entrails hanging from trees were decorations before he came back down here and discovered he not killed all the French. Somebody heard that a man whose nickname was the Butcher was looking for them. So they hopped in their ship and just go looking for him or rather than waiting around to get killed. It's the National well, Guard the Armory. Down south of here. Pedro Hernandez found them, captured them, and gave them two choices. The first choice, the one you expect for a man whose nickname is the Butcher, and that is Die. Uh, certainly not everyone's favorite first choice. They at least want to hear what that second choice is, but that second choice is no better. That second choice Mine's is converted. They don't Katie's hear converted. They hear betray their nation, their family, their religion, everything. They've traveled across that ocean for 250 French soldiers were given this choice, and 12. 12 decided, uh, oh, maybe they had a Catholic grandmother. They decided to go ahead. That's how it rolled out the rest of their lives. The other two of the eight say, Mon Dieu, I guess it's my day to die. Pedro Menendez, willing to oblige, took these French soldiers across the waters of the bay, where one by one he slit their throats, letting their blood flow into the water of that harbor, making that harbor out there run red with blood for three solid days. Now, before that harbor got dredged out, uh, that was a very slow movie body for I believe every word of that history. But uh, you see, here's the thing. Uh, Pedro Menendez didn't want you to forget, so he named that harbor Mitz, Kansas, for massacre. But also, guess what else? You see, you go out there, and something is still going on. I don't know if it's psychic residue or the spirits of the French, but there is still some very strong spirit activity out there. If you get a chance, you run into a sailor, and you have a time. And if I'm a drink, they'll have a few ghost stories for you. One that they all tell, more word of warning than anything else. They say, if you are on your boat late at night, do not look over the side for too long. Often, you'll see lights in the water. Sometimes these lights begin to move, come together, look like eyes. If this happens, they say, look away as quickly as you can. Otherwise, you may find yourself in a trance. Some even use the word possessed. Feel the sense of dread. Terror is so great you would do anything, including going into the water to make it stop. Now, it happens often enough. I've heard the story uh, several times over a beer or so. But there's another one that you can only guess at. See, every two or three years, you look at the newspaper, and there's this boat out there that just gets abandoned. There's a sailor. No one. Nobody. We ask if you did come to St. Augustine by water, do not listen to that call and remain here above the waves. The remainder of our All right, now, uh, as soon as we pass this, you're going to be able to see a very large cross over there. That is a uh, 208 foot tall cross to uh, remind us that uh, 454 years ago, Pedro Menendez uh, arrived here, and then that lovely cross overlooks our bay of Kansas, named for the 238 people that Pedro Menendez killed. But that is actually a pretty small number. St. Augustine has itself a long and bloody history. We roll forward to the year 1821, and that is when the Ship of Doom arrived. Now, you're not going to call it the Ship of Doom right away, no, that would be rude. You wait to limp into harbor, drop maker, and then nothing. They find everyone aboard the ship, they're all dead. The only clue what might have happened, a black tarry goo. Now, while investigating, one of the sailors, not thinking anything of it, got bit by a mosquito. Little did he know when he came back to shore, he brought with him the yellow fever. Now, today, we call it the yellow fever. If skin turns yellow, you get a fever, you can survive that stage. But if you move to the second stage, don't be making any major plans. In the second stage, your internal organs begin to run. They get a yeah, pretty sure that's a yellow fever there. <laughs> your internal organs begin to rot. They need to liquefy that salt inside. Your body does not recognize part of it. It's more like rotten meat. They need to vomit out as a black tarry goo. This place was known as the black vomit. Now, they had no idea the mosquitoes were the problem. Go past housing, had no mosquito netting, the whole family all dead and gone. And they were the lucky ones. They, you see, if somebody caught the black vomit, their relatives would have banned them, afraid to breathe the same air as that uh, black vomit. 
it's really a die alone in these hot, dark, sticky rooms. A doctor went all over the country saying, don't abandon your relatives, say goodbye to them properly. The back vomit is just a symptom, not a cause. And to prove it at the end, to take a small bottle of this stuff, and eat some. But there are these people who spend more time with relatives in those small places. Now, if you take a look right here, we're going past the city gates. And here at the city gates, this is where Elizabeth's spirit is still seen. Now, as nice that portrait I showed you, Elizabeth, is, I do not believe it's accurate. I believe the people have truly seen Elizabeth. They tell me she does not wave with one hand. No, Elizabeth, she waves with two. Her father's soft duty was to protect the city. And in death, she does the same. She stands there to warn you, stay away from St. Augustine. Save yourself, stay away from the yellow beer. Her warning is frightening, but she's there to watch out for us. So I consider to be one of her more friendly spirits. Now speaking of friendly spirits, we've got the friendly spirits, uh, spirits who want to keep their secrets, leave those alone, and uh, spirits that people drink to make them friendly. And a little bit of this right up here on the corner, right? Yeah, quite a little bit of this going on in St. Augustine. A little bit further here, we've got a place called the Casa Blanca Inn. Casa Blanca Inn, built in 1914 by a husband and wife, and it did okay for a few years, and the husband died, and Beatrice, the wife, and nobody's really coming by. Well, fortunately for her, a solution came along. Like to drink in this town, suddenly it became illegal. And so, of course, you know what happened. Everyone in this town saw it. No, they just paid more money for it. The emperor, she made friends with the rubber. The rubber is like love is a little bit of a out and pays through hotels where people are definitely thirsty for a drink. She's making money hand over fist. The FBI, they're investigating all over town. They get to Beatrice. They say, do you know about the Bremeners? She says, I know nothing. But whenever you're in town, you say, find me for free. And uh, well, the Casa Blanca has an unusual feature. Here it is. See, the railing goes all the way across the top of the roof. Well, that becomes a part of her plan. The railing up there. Because now she knows what the FBI is doing their investigations. And so she sets it up. And the rooms coming in out of that harbor out there. And the FBI is not in town. She has great way to make her through all clear. She bring that room right on in. This system worked out great for years. In fact, she started falling in love with one of the rum runners. Her life starts over. But now the FBI, they decide to stay in town one night when they know there's a big storm. A scene, huge shipment coming in. She's torn. Send her about the storm. We'll let it be arrested by the FBI. Finally sent him out to sea, but she never saw him alive ever again. She waited for two years before she finally died of a broken heart. It left the Casa Blanca in place with a classic side of politics. People check in, find their bags unpacked, one most inconvenient fashion. Cold spots all over the building. But on stormy nights, sailors who have never heard the story begin from that inlet will often see a lantern waving above the Casa Blanca Inn. It seems that after all these years, Beatrice spirit slow waits, hoping this time that storm will bring love back into her arms. Alright, so here we find ourselves on the plaza. This was the center of town since way back in colonial times. And uh, we'll take a look on the far side of the Z over here. You see that Constitution monument? Well, before we put that in, that's where it used to carry out our public executions. Go ahead and take your foot as the Constitution monument. You know, never know what you're going to get. Now, uh, who did we execute those days? Well, it was pirates. Oh, hang on, I do want to point out also our balcony here. You can see our balcony. That's where the governor of Washington would be accused. What exactly has he wished? Now, when I say we execute pirates, you got to keep in mind that our definition of pirate was pretty broad. Ever since 15 days, six our friends straight came through, burnt down the whole town. Our definition of pirate was basically anyone who was British with a bad attitude. So you can imagine the whole town uh, uh, scattered around, uh, boys standing on their father's shoulders as uh, we're slowly strangling Englishmen to death. Now, we're not killing people on the plaza for your team anymore. We do hope you find tonight's tour at least half as ghoulish. Now, as we come around the corner here, I do want to point out this building right here. This, of course, is Flags of College. Uh, this is the original building of the Ponce Hotel. This is the Freshman Girls Dormitories. Oh, yes, and uh, this is the building that Ida Alice haunts every holiday season. In fact, uh, I'm not going to point out the room in particular. I'm just going to say it's on the third floor around the back here. And uh, hopefully, uh, our students made it through just fine. And uh, this will be for a happy spring without too many hauntings for Ida Alice. But uh, I'm just going to say, uh, Good luck and uh, pleasant dreams. Now, I mentioned the uh, executions we used to do on the plaza. Now, the method of execution in those days was uh, pretty unusual. On that plaza, they would uh, do, uh, do it by garage. They'd pound a palm log into the ground about six feet high. They'd drill a hole right around that neck, which would be broke through that palm log, and then take that loop of rope and put it around the condemned man's neck. On the other side of the log, they would take a stick and begin twisting to make that rope tighter and tighter. It worked exactly like a tourniquet that the condemned man would never escape from. Andrew Ransom, well, he was captured up north here, or, well, along with three of his friends. Uh, he was brought down to the Spanish governor and said, what do you do, bro? And he says, well, I'm an English map maker. Now, those days, saying you're an English map maker, same thing as confessing to being pirates to buy. So, guess what? 
it's the garage grind your ransom. Now he saw three of his friends step up and lose their lives first. Finally, it's his turn. They placed Looper Grove around his neck and they began twisting. But the first twist, Andrew Ransom could clearly no longer breathe. But the second twist, his face turned purple. But now this English man did the most unexpected thing. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a Spanish Catholic rosary. And he began to pray. The monks assembled with the rest of the town say, Stop, stop the execution. You cannot kill this man. He is a Catholic like the rest of us. The governor, however, unimpressed. From the balcony, he gave the thumbs down. This man's a dirty pirate. The execution must continue. And so, the execution carried on. And the third twist, the veins began to bulge on Andrew Ramson's face. The fourth twist, the blood began to run from his nose. The town, they'd seen this before. They knew the next twist would be his last. Finally, the execution went for that fifth and final twist, and that rope broke. Andrew Ramson, he fell to his knees, pulling the broken rope from his neck, taking another breath after he'd already thought he'd had his last. The monks ran the whole time, saying, This must be the hand of God. And they swept him up and hit him away from the governor. Governor Sangri, a pirate to we know he was saved by God. They went back for months, and turns out he knew how to work with stone. We had started building our great stone fort, Castillo de San Marco. He was given one degree of freedom to help with that fort. Without one degree of freedom, he took a mile. He began dating with governor's daughter. And now our mysteries get solved. Where did he get the rosary? Ah, uh, the handsome young road beneath the town. He caught a ride. Of the rosary that saved his life. Now, if you do do any of your own investigations, capture the orbs of streets down there on the plaza, which we do encourage. Uh, it's not likely that you're going to capture him for ransom. After all, he did survive his day with the executioner. It was far more likely capturing his friends, wondering where they had died, and Andrew Ransom survived by the strangest twist of fate. Dad jokes. All right, so here we are at the, uh, the Huguenot Cemetery. And this is that same cemetery I mentioned before that began as a public burying grounds for all those yellow theater victims. Now, when I say uh, we are at the Huguenot Cemetery, uh, I should probably correct myself because we are now inside the Huguenot Cemetery. Uh, you see, whether on with a train here on the road, we're on the sidewalk, over there in the dirt. Yeah, that fence is not the right place. We are already inside the cemetery now. So please step off to the right. Uh, take all your belongings with you when we're meeting the train. That public burying grounds begins with mass graves, burial pits. They start over there. In many of the mass burial pits, they still remain in this area over here. After it started to peter out a bit, they started to just bury them in more regular graves, but they kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger because people didn't really be buried in, you know, a mass pit anymore until it finally made it all the way over to the clock tower behind you. All right, so what I'm saying is we're here 150 years ago. We'd be standing amongst a forest of wooden grave markers. See, here's the thing. This is Florida. Uh, we do not have a whole lot of stone here. And when people start dying all at once, you do not have enough stone to make proper headstones. So wooden grave markers is what people had to deal with. Now, if you're rich, you'd get yourself a nice one eventually like these folks did, or a nice crypt like those folks did, so you didn't get your grave rod. But most people, it's a wooden grave marker and that's it. A hundred years goes by, that wooden grave marker is just as rotted away as a person underneath it. City comes along and says, hey, you know, we want to put in a traffic circle, a nice little clock tower, it'll be real pretty. You know, we should probably put a fence around the cemetery. You, know, you can tell where it is. It's, it's where the headstones are, right? One little historian says, hold on, hold on, I can show you a map. They say, don't worry about it. We need the space. So as a result, we now stand inside the Huguenot Cemetery. Now, every cemetery here in St. Augustine has a guardian spirit. Here, here we have Judge Stick. All right. So if you look across the cemetery there, oh, that is a very nice home. But if you look across the cemetery there, we have ourselves a very bright light. Underneath that very bright light, we have a tree. Underneath that tree, we have ourselves a tall pointed headstone right there. Anybody? Now, that is the headstone of Judge Stickney. Anybody want to take a wild guess what is not underneath the headstone of Judge Stickney? Judge Stickney? Yeah, there's no judge under there. Now, Judge Stickney came down here a little bit after the Civil War. Part of the uh, Reconstruction, trying to put the country back together after it torn itself apart, ended up being fairly well loved. It died in the early 1880s, got himself a headstone right over there. People going by can say, hey, Judge Stickney, we miss you. Now, this was fine for about nine years until the other members of the Stickney family, they're dying off in Washington, D.C., and they had a very nice tomb up there. Uh, but uh, or the thing is, Judge Stickney's all alone. And so they called out here, can you dig up Judge and send him up to Washington, D.C. Now, it must have been a slow day for Horace Wells, the man who kept this coming here, because as he's digging up the body, half the town gathered around to watch him. So, by the way, he pulled the coffin up out of the ground with two drunken men blowing the crowd up the last day. So, Horace Wells opens up the coffin, takes him some sight, and sees Judge Dickey, pretty good shape for a man who's been dead for nine years. Now, the crowd by this point, they've been waiting all morning. They're quite serious. They begin to push in. As they push in, Horace Wells pushed back away from the coffin. Now, you see people, they, they're looking for trophies here. They are messing with Judge Stickney's bones. And the keys of the graveyard, this is his worst nightmare. 
then went back, back, and picked it, and now he realizes that no one has gold, and Judge Dixie, gold teeth. Now he looked around and recognized everybody except for the two drunken men, but they were gone. Finally, nothing to do after two days of searching, but close up the coffin, send Judge Dixie, knife the teeth, up to Washington, D.C. Now, yes, his body made it up there, but his spirit still remains. They say quite often, late at night, you see a man dressed all in black, black strings high, ducking down near a very base flat headstone right over there. Judge Stickney, still looking for those teeth of his, somewhere in that tall grass. Now, the thing is, when that happened to him, that's when he became this cemetery's guardian spirit. He will not let any other body, any other soul be desecrated the way that his was. So, when we stand here, we have some interest. People for 20, 30 years or more have been studying a spirit that appears in that tree right over there. I believe it's so you can get a better look at us all the way over here. But uh, for the most part, I don't have to worry. I mean, honestly, you folks seem to be pretty honest, legitimate investigators. But there are some nights. Okay, you guys have seen some of the ghost hunting shows, right? There's that one out there, I'm not going to name, but it's got that one uh, host who really is sometimes more interested in provoking the spirits rather than really respecting them. Okay, that guy. And sometimes there's a, sometimes there's somebody on this tour who's really inspired by that. Usually I catch them in time, but I had a friend of mine, get a group right over there, she didn't see what was going on. The guy says, all right, I know what I'm going to do. So he says, all right, I got it. He goes, what's that? What's that? What's that? Judge Stickney, you had no trust in justice. You would lock on it when he got that far before he began to choke. It happened so fast, my friend thought she was going to have to use a Heimlich maneuver on him. Now, he kind of got it back together after a moment. But he thought that, that was just enough to kind of, you know, meant that he kind of made contact. And that meant that, you know, he should keep going. So he goes, and that was it for him. He fell to his knees, reaching towards so He felt like an icy hand was crushing his throat, he said. Now for him, that was the end of the tour. He finally breathed, but he, he didn't get up off the ground after a minute or so. He went over to the bars over there. He was done. But you see, that's Judge Stickney. He'll let us know that uh, we can talk about the dead. We can stand on them. That's the thing that just happens here in St. Augustine. Being truly disrespecting the dead, that's him when he will remind you that it does not matter where we the living put these hollow fences. This is still the domain of the dead. And in this domain, the dead, they will demand their respect. Now, the good news is Judge Stigney doesn't mind me throwing a little bit of shade on this next spirit because, quite honestly, he probably deserves some. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, head over this way. Not very far. Just over to here. If you have a look right about there, you will see a bit of a uh, bit of rubble there. <laughs> that rubble there, there is a body under there where there used to be a headstone. And here we have sort of the opposite to to situation. Uh, no headstone in the body. Over there we've got a very nice headstone. But here we've got Roland the Scoundrel. Now Roland, Roland came down here a little bit after that yellow fever outbreak of 1821. And Roland, Roland knew a very interesting fact. He knew that there was no way the US Army was going to be sending experienced soldiers to that fort right over there after a yellow fever outbreak. They, they don't want to have another round come through and kill off all their best officers, so it's all rookies wet behind the ears. And perfect Roland was really good at, which was cheating at cars. Oh, Roland was really good at cheating cars. Roland was so good at cheating at cars, he took the entire month's pay from those soldiers and put it into his own pocket. Came to the attention of one of the colonels. The colonel says, all right, Roland, watch play cards me. What exactly is gonna happen? Now, the colonel did not have a direct answer for him, but two nights later, a single shot was heard from the St. French Street boarding house where Roland was staying. Now, everyone heard the shot. We're sure we go, oh, it's, uh, it's Roland. Uh, I didn't say anything. You say anything? No, no, no. You say anything? I didn't hear anything. No, 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 no. And normally, for a scoundrel like Roland, this would be the end of the story. But it turns out Roland, Roland got himself a headstone back in the days when most people got themselves a wooden grave marker. Yep. See, it turns out Roland, not only very good with cards, also very good with the ladies, too. Not just one, but two ladies showed up shortly after he died, took all of Roland's money, a little bit of their own, and bought him a very nice little headstone, which was once right there. Uh, the small problem, though, is this. Uh, that headstone, uh, right next to one of those ladies' family plots. And they didn't even have a proper marker early on. They just had wooden, uh, wooden uh, headstones there, wooden grave markers. Eventually, they got a little nice one. But during that time, a young cousin came along and said, you know what, that just isn't right and destroyed the final resting place of good old Roland. Even so, Roland still knows he did pretty well. We often hear the sound of shuffling cars coming over here. And I always like to make certain that I step so that I'm standing here and the women with their back against this gate because if I do it the other way around, I'm usually about halfway through the story when you suddenly see a very shocked expression come across a woman's face as Roland comes up behind her, lets her know he may be dead, but he is still thinking about the lady. We got some friendly ghosts in this town, some perhaps a little bit too friendly. 
<laughs> All right, so we have a uh Seems like what about every two or three years, a uh, sci-fi channel or somebody puts up a new uh, ghost show, and they decide, oh, you know, this is a good place to go through because, well, that many ghosts, there's got to be something, and they almost always find something. Um, the uh, very psychics I mentioned that we've had before, they've actually gone through and documented various entities. Now, why would this place be so haunted? Well, first of all, let's make sure: are we all here? Is anyone missing? Ask them and see. You're looking that way. Is everybody coming this way? No. Okay, all right. Looks good so far then. All right. I don't see anybody running this way. Nope. All right. Looks like we are good. Uh, this looks like the right count, but I always like to make sure nobody's actually like missing somebody. All right. So now let's see. Uh, so first thing you should do is uh, you should not build your building on top of an abandoned English burial trench. Okay, now how do you get an English burial trench? Well, you get that by having a really good Spanish fort that the English attack, 1702-1740, and leave hundreds of English bodies behind. And then the Spanish don't give a proper burial, you know, not the same country, not the same religion, so just trenches to make sure that the bodies don't start stacking up and rotting. So, bodies in the trenches, you know, a proper burial. So that's the first thing. Uh, that site's left alone for a few hundred years, then William Ward decides to build on top of it, and he ignores the obvious warning signs, obvious warning signs, like... Uh, well, let's see, people are injured during the building of it, a guy who disappears completely, we like to think he walked off the job, but William Ward not upset by such reports, no, he's the type of guy who kept a Ouija board in the cupboard. He along just fine with those ghosts for many years, until one day he walked out in front of the building and saw the most impossible ghost he could see, he saw his own ghost. Now you see, this was not a ghost, this was an omen, a warning, he was not to leave St. Augustine, as soon as he could, he was sure he died. In fact, his entire family, 40 kids in Hawaii, 30 days, they were gone. They abandoned the beautiful home. His abandoned for a decade and a half before a writer came along and turned out hotel. As a hotel was good, usually you could uh, check in any name you want, some of the big old exit you want to do. Sometimes that's fine, sometimes two people check in, only one of them checks out. That poor church to the ghost gallery, the one enjoying a glass of wine as the room burns out behind her. Yeah, I have it inside this building right here. Let's see. Oh, uh, then eventually, of course, Robert Ridley begins to see it. He decides that well, after he's dead, he'll tell his will, he'll put in his will to buy the place up and turn in the museum. So it's got uh, clothes in here that are made out of human bone, drums in here, skinned with human skin, a candle in here made from human fat, from a monk no less. Uh, it's a bunch of torture and saw many years of use before they entered this collection. Uh, you put all these things inside a building with this kind of history, you've got a magnet for ghosts. So, thank you for taking the Ripley's Ghost Train Adventure. The train part's over, and uh, guess what? You guys are going inside the building now, so this is part I'm going. I could work on the train at the castle, they said. Something goes wrong with the train, I get to leave. That sounds like a good idea. Something goes wrong with the castle, I'm stuck inside with the rest of you folks. All right, now if you did enjoy your tour tonight, I will point out that you'll find some coffins in there that are uh, especially for dead presidents. And, uh, oh! Or if you want to take it easy on your pocketbook, go on TripAdvisor and say, My tour with Tim, uh, Nick, and who's on the other side of Jamie there? I cannot see who's on the other side of Jamie. And your guide tonight is Chelsea. Uh, Tim, Nick, and Chelsea. Uh, that is the same thing as putting five bucks in each of our pockets. All right. So. Okay, everyone. As Nick said, my name is Robin, and I would like to welcome you to the Castle Morning Hotel. Or at least that's where we would be if we were here in 1944. Before this was the Castle Room Hotel, this was actually an open field and part of the fort grounds. More specifically, we would be standing on the burial grounds of the fort grounds. Now, we're not sure if the man who built this building, his name is William Morton, if he knew where he, where he was building his building. We just know that he chose this beautiful area to build the building based on how close it was to downtown. Um, in fact, if you're standing in different areas of this building, you can actually see straight down to St. George Street, which does seem like a very nice place. Unfortunately for him, he was not aware of how much paranormal activity that he was getting himself into. Our first recorded case of paranormal activity actually happened while he was here. It happened down in this room here. His youngest daughter was out in what would have been the formal living room when she watched a man dressed as a British soldier walk across the front of the doors and then disappear where Jack Sparrow stands today. Now we're not 100% sure why William Morton and his family decided to abandon this building. We just know that in 1927 they abruptly vacated it, leaving it completely abandoned for about 15 years. During that abandoned pyramid period, it became known as the Castle of Doom. Now every single bad thing you could think happening in a, a abandoned building happened in this building. 
we had drugs, we had, you know, trespassing, there was voodoo, and eventually when a body was found where the uh, statue of David stands today, the city finally got its way and decided to tear down this building. Fortunately for us and for you, two weeks before this building was fit to be destroyed, a, a woman named Margie Keating Rowling came in and saved the building. Now, does anybody know who Margie Keating Rowling is? Yes. Yes? Wow. <laughs> And she saw this building and she absolutely loved it. And she thought this would be a perfect place for an upscale hotel. Wow. And that's exactly what this building was when in 1944, a man walked in through the front doors here and signed and bought, purchased two rooms and signed his name next to one of those rooms. And he signed it with simply an X. Now, because we know this man is nothing else, we just call him Mr. X. A short while later, a young woman came in and signed her name next to the second room that he purchased, and she wrote Betty Richardson. Her real name actually was Betty Richardson. She was a young woman from Jacksonville. She was a dressmaker, and she was actually Mr. X's mistress. Unfortunately for Betty and one other victim, both of their bodies would be found in this building a short while later after a short fire in here. Now, as we ascend into the building, I am going to tell you a little bit more about the things that happened that day, and I'm also going to give you a little insight into the paranormal activity that we experience here today. Now, if everybody will follow me up these stairs, I do believe I have an elevator waiting for you. Kristen, are you there? Nobody know who Mr. X was. Well, just like everybody else staying in this building, Mr. X was extremely wealthy, and so was the man that was staying in this room on that day. Now, the day that everything happened, it was uh, April 23rd, 1944. It was a Sunday, and everybody that was staying here was enjoying a very relaxing day, and so was the man in here. He's just lounging to do something. Well, what he saw as he was peeking out that door was the man in the room directly above him dragging bed linens across to the other side. Upon further review, he realized it was a woman's body wrapped in those bed linens. Now, the witness did not die in this room. He fled. But he had such a negative energy in here that he has left something so negative behind that people still feel it to this day. Most tour guides do not actually go past this little threshold here because they feel so uncomfortable walking in here after something that's happened to them. Now, I did mention voodoo earlier in my intro. That is because we have constantly had mediums and psychics and different paranormal investigators coming in and saying, go into this room. There's something in this room. Specifically, there's something in this wall. So eventually, we tore out this wall and we found a very nice fireplace behind it. And in that fireplace, we found human and animal sacrificial bones. Obviously, the fireplace and the bones are not there anymore because nobody wants skeletons literally in their closet. <laughs> our, our best areas for paranormal activity in here are over in this corner right here, where many people actually get a picture of a young woman crouching next to the bench where the tree is. And then we also get really great photos along the wall here as well. Which wall? Uh, the one where the TV is, where the half man is, because that's where the fireplace would have been.
interesting enough, you actually can go out and do investigations for the investigations. You can actually go out and see the sports marks are under the board floor cameras. And we have one on the 21st of this month. Okay. Hi, everybody. Okay. So the room that the majority of us are standing in would have been Mr. X's room. Now, can anybody guess what room number this would have been? 10, 6, 13. 8, 13, yes. Mm -hmm. Lucky number, 13. This is a very fitting number for what was about to happen in this room. Now, when Betty checked in, she went up to her room, and she realized that she was not next to Mr. X. Now, this was very peculiar. They were always situated next to each other whenever they went out, whenever they met. So she decided that she was gonna go looking for him. And that's exactly what she had to do. She had to look for him. So she goes around banging on most of the doors, not getting an answer, until eventually she comes to this door right here, which is the door that would have been for number 13. Mr. X hears her banging, gets up, lets her in, and she automatically starts screaming at him. Why are you doing this to me? I deserve better than this. I deserve answers. Mr. X lets her scream for a little bit, eventually stops her because he doesn't want to you know, get a commotion have people coming to his room. So he looks at her and very calmly says, Betty, I'm so sorry. This was gonna be our last weekend together. After this, we're gonna part ways. And I wanted to be very nice, I wanted to be amicable. Well, she thought she was in love with Mr. X. She didn't like that answer. So she decides she's gonna to try to hang on to the best way that she can think of, which is blackmail. So she looks at Mr. X and she says, you break up with me. I tell everybody you know we've been together. I tell your boss, I tell your wife, I tell your friends, and then I tell your wife. Now when she says wife, Mr. X snaps. He grabs Betty and he goes to throw her towards this wall over here and misses the wall and hits her head on the fireplace that is unfortunately now behind the lift disc woman. This is the room where Betty dies. Now obviously this was not his plan. He wanted to end everything peacefully. He wanted to go part, you know, part ways per perfectly. So he freaks out, he throws Betty on the bed, wraps her in the bed linens, and drags her back to her room so that he can come up with a plan of what he's going to do. Now, just like downstairs, this is another very negative energy room. Everybody feels extremely uncomfortable in here. Um, we get really great photos, actually, in this corner right here of a man, very tall man, with a pale white face who is just looming over everybody else in the room. We also get a very nice, playful spirit, and that is actually of the mummy cat that we see behind us in that display case. A lot of people get pictures of a black cat weaving in between Rawlings. She was living here because she was in an abusive relationship with her husband. And when Marjorie found out, she said, come and live in my hotel completely rent free. Just as long as you help out a little bit, I'll be perfectly fine and you can have that room. That's where, Betty, that's where Ruth was living. When Mr. X came walking out this way and at just the same time as Ruth happened to be walking down these stairs. Now, Mr. X sees Betty, or Ruth, believes Ruth knows what he's done, maybe heard the commotion. He freaks out, he runs across this little hallway here and kills Ruth right here in her doorway before dragging her back upstairs, back to her room. Now Ruth and Betty are found in the exact same positions. It's very odd that they would have been found in the same positions because these two women did not know each other. But that's a little bit, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in Betty's actual room. Now, I just want to point out this display case right here. It's got a Star Wars Lego figure in it, I believe. Um, it does stick out quite a bit from the wall. So as you're coming around, I just want you to make sure to be careful and not hit it because you don't want that story of how you were walking around Ripley's and you ran into a display case at night. So if everybody will follow me down this way, we're going to head to bed. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
should put a light under it. front.
Now we get really great photos of orbs and spirits and um, actually that tall man with a pale face, we actually did get a photo of him over on the side here. Um, people have actually gotten photos of what they believe to be Betty over in this corner right here. And in this seat uh, last night, actually, a woman had a very steady EMF reading as she was sitting there as I was talking about Betty. And even if I, after I stopped talking about Betty, there was still a very red EMF reading in that seat. Now, I do suggest you guys take photos. As I said, this is a really great area to take photos. Um, suggest these two areas in between the, um, the windows here. You guys can get up and take photos. You can stay seating, but we are going to move on in the next couple of minutes, and I'll let you know when we're ready to move on. Maybe you just don't have a connection. I don't know. No more steps. Hey, this is paper. No, this is actually not paper. This is actually bubble uh, chewing gum wrappers. <laughs> we also have a dust made of hair right here. And every time I take somebody past the uh, display case, they're always like, you know, I can make one of those. I have so much hair, I can make one too. <laughs> He was the leader of Haiti. He um, used this doll to decide who he Duff, was going to doll. kill. Um, it, he said he would whisper to him and tell him, kill everybody with red shirts today. And that's exactly what he would do. Oh. Now, because this did happen in the late to early 80s, um, uh, we do have people who come through who did have family members who were affected by Papa Doc. So that is why that voodoo doll sits in the back display case where nobody can see it. I do recommend as we're going past him, you can take photos, but do not look in his eyes. They say if you look in his eyes, something bad, I know, I know. But they say if you look in his eyes, something bad will happen to you, so we're going to go down. Don't look in his eyes, just like, Ooh, I just looked in his eyes by accident. The head is positioned to where you have to look at its eyes. I'm sorry. I don't know, Katie. Well, when you come around that corner and you look straight ahead, you look in his eyes. I'm sorry. What you doing? Okay, you guys, I'm going to say this is the end of this video. Um, hopefully, I can get it all in one. I won't know until I get back and I piece it together. It might be a long video. Um, if this is two-part, I don't know yet. I'm hoping to have one. But this was the haunted tour through um, on the red train through St. Augustine. And you start out at Ripley's Believe It or Not. They take you to a couple places. They took us to, I don't remember, an uh, uh, old uh, homestead area. Then they took us to a graveyard. And then they brought us back to the um, Ripley's Believe It or Not and took us into it after dark. So we got a tour through that, through some of the rooms where hauntings are supposed to happen. And what I found the most interesting thing was the connection to Marjorie Rollins, who wrote The Yearling in Cross Creek. Um, she was a author. Um, I've been to her home over in Cross Creek, um, um, Florida. There's a it's a it's, it's a state park now, Florida State Park, or Florida State Historical Park, or whatever. But it it's her homestead, and I always wonder why she could afford to be there as a single woman. Um, she later married, but I always wondered how she could afford 
to live there and do what she did. And now it kind of makes sense because she was the owner of the hotel here that the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum is on. Um, so it's very, I thoroughly enjoyed this. Now a few people were like, my thing's not turning red, my thing's not turning red. It was a history tour at night telling you about some of the deaths that have happened. Yeah, it's more of in, the dark history. Yeah, it's the dark history of St. Augustine, some of it. So your little Geiger counter thing did not go off. Don't bellyache about it. Enjoy the... <laughs> Katie's went off non-stop. Mine never went off. And do I believe in spirits? Yes, I do. Do I think I've seen some in my life? Yes, I do. Do I feel like I got gypped because my goggle thing did not go off and turn red? No, I do not. So my thing is come and do this because it's a piece of history. It's an activity to do at night. It's safe. You get to go into Ripley's Believe It after dark and walk through some of it in the dark. That's cool as all get out. The tour guide we had, Tim, was excellent. I forget what his, what his stage name was, but his name was Tim. Um, I got it. He says it on the video. We had a blast, didn't we, Katie? Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to say like and subscribe if you like my videos. Um, as I always say, enjoy the craziness of life because you might laugh about it when you tell your friend. I'm going to say goodnight because this is a long video. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.